Hey folks, this is Rabble Rouse and Rich Bergeron. Ladies and gentlemen, the tornado turned to Pentagon. And Psychic Tom Pageant, full of predictions as always. Accurate as always. All right. Oh. Well, uh, I guess Rich said he was going to turn the uh, mic over to me um, to start off. And you, know, you hate starting off stating that. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna babble a lot, guys, though. Uh, it's going off on Saturday, you know. Yeah. But, but yeah, uh, also friend, mentor. In a way, God, we all we all have ties to. In some crazy way. Um. Uh, I think, uh, share with you on um, social media, and I will get them to you, um, some of the uh, tributes that have been coming out. But well, we lost a um, personal friend of mine, Hank Sisko, and I know you guys have heard me talk about him. You've seen clips of, you know, him, um, you know, if he was the MC and the guest of honor when I filmed my boxing training video a couple years ago. He was a true legend in the sport. He was a legend um, in the area where I live. So, um, 15th round, you know, he, he went the distance. Yeah, was he 95 years old, right, Tony? Uh, 96, Rich. 96, so. Well, it was, um, in, in a way kind of fitting long, long that, um, yeah, last year, um, before he got sick, and it was, we found, uh, they hadn't made it public until recently, but it was uh, pancreatic cancer, um, which is, you know, uh, deadly. Um, the um, He had been hospitalized about a year ago, literally about a year ago, because I went to visit him on January 11th of last year. And um, spirits were good. Um, we weren't sure what it was at the time, uh, because very yellow jaundice, we didn't know if it was something affecting his liver or something like that, um, high spirits. Um, but he progressively uh, deteriorated. Uh, they brought him home in March on hospice care and figured it was only going to be a few days. I remember a friend of mine had called me up on a Monday night and he said, they're bringing him home tomorrow. Get there as soon as you can because it's not going to be long term. And I went there on that Saturday and at the request of his family, I broke out the new Phillies office. I wanted to make sure he saw it. And when I walked in that house, he was so gleeful. And he gave a big shout out, yo, Tornado. And I'm like, I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't expecting it. I was happily not expecting it. And then um, he had um, ties with Michael Grant. When Michael Grant was, you know, um, uh, you know, contender for the heavyweight championship, Michael had flown in that day from Atlanta. And he was upstairs, you know, resting. And, you know, and Hank had yelling at his daughter. Go wake him up so he can meet the tornado. Wake Michael Graham up so he can meet me. Who the hell am I, right? I'm just an idiot in a hat and a cape. Um, but his daughter's like, Dad, he's sleeping. Let him sleep. His daughter looked at me and goes, please tell my dad you're going to be here for a while. And I'm like, yo, rock. I'm going to be here. I'm, gonna, I'm not leaving. I'll be here for a couple of hours. You know, let the man sleep. We'll see me when he comes down. When we heard him rumbling upstairs, we're like, oh, thank God he's awake. Um, but I went a couple more times after that, I visited him, and it was always high spirits. Um, the last time I went to see him was about a month ago, and we knew that it was um, getting close. Um, he was a founding member of this Italian organization that I'm part of, and every year they have a big Christmas banquet, and every year they bring me in to do the Santa Claus bit, and... Um, Obviously, this year, you know, he was unable to attend, so I said to his daughter, who's the president of it, and I said, if he can't come here, why can't I bring Santa to him? And I said, you know, the tree lot's only around the corner. Um, tomorrow night, which was a Sunday, I said, I'm only working till 5. Well, I'm not closing up at 10 o'clock. I said, I'm working till 5. I got the suit on me. I'll throw it on. I'll drive around the corner. I'll come over. And when, when I got there, a couple times, like previously when I go, he had been, um, you know, nodded off. 
but as soon as I would say, yo, rock, it's a tornado, we'd wake right up, and you, hey, tornado. Well, last month he didn't do that, and he was drifting in and out of consciousness that day, and he, you know, he'd open his eyes for a, a second or two, but you, you knew, you knew the inevitable was coming. Um, two months ago, on his 96th birthday, November 9th, that was the day that I was doing the, um, the Rocky Run. And what I did was kind of my good luck charm. Um, the previous year for Halloween, we bumped into each other. He was at a, a dinner event, and I was downstairs at a bar for their Halloween party, and I was dressed as Rocky Balboa. So they brought me upstairs to see him. We did some photos together, and I took the one photo, and I put it in my robe pocket, and I carried it with me as I ran on his 96th birthday. I dropped that picture off to him uh, last month, so he has it. And, um... Great guy. <laughs> Great guy. And, um, you know, you told us a little bit about him because uh, you were on a show a couple times, too. Don't forget to talk yeah. about that. Uh, but he also had a connection to Rocky because he actually worked out with Rocky. I think he actually sparred him, too, yeah. right? Well, I don't, I don't, um, and, and he, he may have, and he may have told me that in, in passing, um, he was a, a little bit smaller than, than Rocky, um, I think he was more of like the, um, 150-some pound range, right. so he would have been probably about 30 pounds, or uh, lighter at least, uh, but, you know, back in then, you know, you worked with whoever was in the gym with you, and I know Eddie Futch used to spar with Joe Lewis, and Joe Lewis would say, <laughs> if I can catch you, I can catch anybody, um, <laughs> But, you know, you're right, and you're right. He did, um, you know, train under Charlie Goldman. Uh, he was originally for, uh, from Brooklyn, New York, um, trained under Charlie Goldman. Then he emigrated to um, Norristown, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Philadelphia. Um, you know, it's about 20-some minutes from where I grew up in Glenside, and it's about 20-some minutes from where I live now in Harleysville. Um, he had a managing piece of Michael Grant, and... He was also a professional referee, and some of the stories he would say, you know, um, as a referee, you know, refereeing one of Joe Frazier's first pro fights, um, refereeing um, Marvin Hagler and Bobby Boogaloo Watts at the Philadelphia Spectrum, um, you know, uh, throwing Muhammad Ali out of the ring. Um, I think Ali either might have been in exile at the time, I don't remember for sure, um, but yeah, wealth of stories, and you know, like the the outpouring. It's the different people, like in the boxing community. Uh, when I posted it, I had people from the boxing community reach out to me. Um, I had people, um, you know, from the local area. I mean, I had people texting me shortly after I got the phone call. I mean, I was driving to work on Tuesday, and I was about fifteen minutes away from the office. And when the phone rang, and I saw it was son of all. I kind of braced myself. I knew it wasn't good. Took a deep breath. Said, all right, Tim, get ready. You know what's coming. And so on and so forth it was. And, I mean, I had barely got into work. I was in work 20 minutes, and a friend of mine texted me. He goes, yo, I heard. And I'm like, yeah, I just got the phone call. Um, I took a phone call. Um, well, I got the message Tuesday night, and I responded yesterday, yesterday morning that I will be one of his pallbearers, which is an amazing honor. Awesome. And um, another thing that I said, and you guys probably won't know the name, um, but it's a major name in Philadelphia, um, Frank Rizzo. Frank Rizzo was um, the, chief, uh, the, the Philadelphia chief of police back in the 70s, controversial figure, some some good, some bad. Um, and Is he, he the guy that they get the Jerky Boys Frank Rizzo from? He has to be. They were from New York, right? Well, no, well uh, Frank, Rizzo, Frank Rizzo's Philadelphia. Um, oh, Philadelphia. But that, that, are the Jerky yeah, Boys that from there? Been, <laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be hilarious, though, because that's the only <laughs> other Frank Rizzo I know of. <laughs> yeah, well, the, well this, this Frank Rizzo, who was the mayor of Philadelphia in the 70s and 80s, um, he passed away in 1991. Ah. And Hank was such a good friend of his. He was one of Frank Rizzo's pallbearers. Right. So, you know, I, I kind of turned around and said, I said, well, basically, it's like I'm Frank Rizzo's pallbearer once removed now. <laughs> so, yeah. 
but um, I, Narstown tomorrow is going to be <coughs> an unbelievable, um, it's going to be a madhouse tomorrow. I, the church, I, now the church that they're having this at, uh, it's um, kind of crazy. I go to a festival there every year, but I've never actually been in the church. <laughs> um, I, I go to their Italian festival, and um, parking's never easy for the Italian festival. Um, tomorrow, I don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know when. Um, the viewing alone is nearly four hours. I was talking to his daughter last night when they asked him to be a Paul Bearer, um, which, if, like I said, of course, I accept that in two seconds. Um, but I said, you know, it's from 8.30 to 12, and I said, that's still not, not, not be able to accommodate everybody. Um, and about a month ago, you know, before, you know, I went to see him the last time, they were planning to have me back on the show uh, last year. Like, I was on the show twice in 2016. Um, and you know, I, I say, you know, how things, things work out in life. Um, Hank Cisco was, um, you know, my, everybody knew who he was, right? And his family had a bar down in Flower Town about maybe 15 minutes before I grew up. And I'd been there maybe when I was 22 years old. I don't know if he was there or not. I don't remember. Um, but they had, like, they used to have a lot of boxing memorabilia you there because the family was basically a bunch of fighters. And they had a fight poster there from back way, way, way in the day, right? Well, one of the guys on the flight poster was an assistant coach from Lock Haven that I knew and actually had passed away, like, that year, you know, which was kind of crazy. Um, so, um, you know, I first got to meet Hank in 2013. My dad worked with his son-in-law. They were both, you know, electrical linemen, and my dad would always... You know, say, oh, this guy Ricky, his father-in-law, Hank Cisco, professional boxing referee, was a boxer, was this and that. But my dad didn't really know him that well. Only really knew the name. So I'm at a fight card one night at the Valley Forge Casino where Tom, you know, you and I went. And uh, this was a few months before that time you, you met me there. Um, and my dad was mad at me that night. He didn't want to go to the fights. So he's pissed off at me. So he didn't go. Me and some of my buddies went. And, um, you know, Hank, Hank was there with his son-in-law that my dad worked with. And I said, wow, I said, this is the guy I've heard so much about. And he gets in the ring, gets on the microphone, and he is, like, doing, like, a stand-up comedy routine. And I'm like, this guy is hilarious, you know? This little old man, you know, he's really funny. He was 89 years old. And I'm like, I got to go up and say hello. So I did, and I saw his son-in-law that knew me through my dad and said hi to him. We did a photo together, you know? You know, no thought about it. We just take a photo, and it's done. A few years later, um... You know, 2016, it was shortly after I um, lost Vinny, which is going to be, ironically, four years tomorrow. So the day I'm burying one icon is the four-year anniversary of losing one of my best friends. So um, I see I see him on Facebook, and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to suggest to friends. I'm just going to click add and see what happens. And he accepted it within a matter of seconds, not knowing who I was, right? And uh, I had posted something about a fundraiser we were doing a Frank Sinatra night. And he commented on it and said, hey, why don't you come on my TV show and promote this? And I'm like, well, I'd love to, but I'm literally in a shuttle on my way to the airport to go to Florida. And so I sent it to my, my aunt who was coordinating. And I'm like, hey, you know, why don't you do this? She goes, let's wait till you come back because I need you on the show with me. Okay, sure. So as I'm going on the show, and he's now he's like messaging me, telling me, he's like, hey, bring some things to engage conversation, like a show and tell. Bring flyers, bring this, bring that. And I'm like, okay. And a couple of things that I brought just to add to the conversation was a picture that we took that day, Rich, a fresh Anna statue dedication. Mm-hmm. And then I did one of me in my outfit at the, at the Joe Frazier statue dedication. You know, all things to kind of tie into the boxing circle, right? And as, uh, we're about to go on the air. The uh, guy that is the uh, audiovisual instructor says, hey, um, he goes, you just got to, we give him, like, some talking points, but he goes where he wants to go. Just try to keep up with him. Well, my aunt froze. 
And she looked at me and said, you have to do all the talking. I said, well, that's not a problem. <laughs> first question, yeah, and I, as you know, right? Yeah. Um, and the first question was, um, hey, tell us about your organization. I look at her, I said, well, this is one you got to take. And she was like, um, we're, we're the auxiliary of the fire company. And like, she was just so through like a deer in the headlights. And then Hank and I get on and we start talking and we just start, you know, we're talking about Halloween when he was a kid dressing up as Rudolph Valentino, right? <laughs> and we had a hilarious, well, now he sees the picture of me in this Phillies attire. Now I was on the show in a sequin gold tuxedo. He sees me in the Phillies attire and I said, as you see, I like shiny things. And you could see the wheels turn. And he goes, I need you back on in that. I said, done. <laughs> and I came back on the room. Then he started inviting me to all his Italian dinners, his, as he calls them, manjunis, kind of like manja. Yeah. And uh, he'd always say, you got to wear the Philly stuff. You got to wear the Philly stuff. And it'd be like the middle of January. And I'm like, I'm oh, the Philly stuff. You're playing, and it's like 20 degrees out. That thing's kind of cold. But you never said no to him. If he said Philly stuff, that's what you wore. <laughs> um... And last year, you know, when they were having the, um, they booked me on the show for early February before he went in the hospital. So he goes in the hospital, and now I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I didn't know who to contact. You know, I'd already been booked about like a month ago. I'm like, who do I call? Is this thing still going to happen? Am I supposed to show up? Who do I talk to? And I'm sitting there, and that Tuesday before the show, I had my mind made up that this isn't happening. You know, not happening. Um, my original plan for the show was I was going to take my hat and cape and retire them on the air. Um, but I'm like, yeah, the show's not going to happen. My hat and cape were down at the um, the new guy making my outfit, so I didn't even have access to that. And I'm like, eh. well, I get a phone call from his assistant. She's like, listen, we still have tomorrow booked, and we really need you. We need someone that's colorful and interesting. Please be there tomorrow. I said, okay, you got my word, I'm there. And I'm sitting there uh, talking to the guy that was, you know, the, 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 the class instructor who was filling in as the host that day. And at the time, we were under the hope that Hank was going to beat this and he was going to be back and he was going to fill that chair again and, you know, and it was just, you know, we were just holding that hope. And I remember on the on the air when this guy John Doyle was introducing his he goes, hey, I'm still filling in for Hank. And he goes, I'm not nearly as colorful. I'm not nearly as interesting. I'm not nearly as funny. He goes, I, I am not a person you want to listen to. Thankfully, today, I have someone that is. And then that's how he introduced me. <laughs> um, and I'll see John Doyle tomorrow. They had called me uh, back in November trying to book me. For like, they're like, hey, can you come in tomorrow and do the show? And I'm like... Um, I'm in the middle of open enrollment at work and I'm like busy out the ears. I said, but we can do it shortly after the new year starts. And they um, called me, I think it was like December 30th and we were talking on the phone. And I said, um, they're like, how about January 15th? And I said, well, here's the problem. I said, um, I have a half a day, the one day that week and I'm off the following Monday. I said, I'm going to be up to my ears that day alone. I said, can we make it the 29th? And thank God we did because he passed away on the 14th. Because if we would have went through with the show, John Doyle, who's been working with him for 22 years, and myself, we wouldn't have got a word out. Neither of us. Yeah. We would just, it would have been a 30 minute sob fest. And that's not what I want. You know, uh, I'm glad I was able to compose myself a little bit tonight after. A rocky start. I know tomorrow is not going to be easy, but um, one of the things that he always said was, you know, don't ever lose a fight in the dressing room. You know, you can go out there and you can sit there and convince yourself you're not going to win, and you're already you're already beaten. And hey, as a as a fighter, I know there were times you were walking it out there and you're like, I'm fighting a guy that's bigger than me, he's stronger than me, he's faster than me, he's better than me. And, and you're walking out there and you already have your head hung in defeat. And then, and then there were times I'm fighting the guy and I'm like, he's not as good as I thought he was, but I would given him too much respect and it was too late. Um, so tomorrow, I will not lose the fight in the dressing room. You know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to honor him 
the best of my ability, and, um, you know, and you know, we did him proud. Yeah, and we've always enjoyed hearing about him on the show and, and, and all your adventures. It, it seemed to me like he was kind of like a second grandpa to you. Yeah. And uh, I, I got a guy like that myself. I don't do radio shows or TV shows with him, but uh, I don't have a grandpa left. You know, my mother's yeah. uh, grandfather, uh, my mother's father's dead, and my, my father's father I never knew. Uh, yeah. I knew his stepfather, but he's gone now, too. <clears throat> so uh, there's a guy named Richard, same as me, <laughs> Richard Smith. And uh, he, he actually is into the football, so we have conversations about football. But he was a guy I delivered wood to one day, and now every time he calls me, I you know change the schedule to, to make sure he gets wood. And he lost his wife last year, and he's probably you know creeping up on 90 himself, uh, so he probably doesn't have much time left. But um, every right. year we try to do something for veterans, and he's a Marine Corps vet. So last year we went over, and uh, somebody had cut up a tree for him that fell over in a storm. And so last year, for free on Veterans Day, we went and split every piece of it up for him and stacked it up. And now I still sell him firewood every year. But uh, yeah, I try to do something nice every year for, for somebody. Yeah. But uh, I know the feeling. <laughs> Having that yeah, honorary every, grandpa. Exactly. Because, and, and similar to the way you, you said that, we in the way are the same and the opposite at the same time. Because I never knew my mother's father. He passed away a couple years before I was born. He passed away before my parents even met. Um, and my father's father um, passed away when I was seven. And I always talked about my my grandfather, the one that I knew, my grandfather Tony, the original Tony. Um, and him and his brother-in-law were both big Rocky Marciano fans. And his brother-in-law was the one that went to the Marciano Walcott fight in Philadelphia and then the, and he had the program, the ticket. He, he saved a lot of the newspaper articles from the rematch with Walcott and the uh, first fight with Ezra Charles. And they were all eventually then given to me. But I always told the story when I was a little kid, uh, shortly before both my grandfather and my uncle, my uncle Eddie um, died. Uh, they died within a matter of months of each other. I was maybe about six, right? And uh, Rocky Three had just come out. And one day we were having the big, you know, um, Sunday dinner over, you know, the, my grandmother's house, and um, you know, and I guess they thought at six years old was the time where you were, you know, ready to learn about Rocky Marciano. And I remember they, they sat me down. They're like, "All right, we want to tell you about Rocky Marciano." And I'll never forget. I remember saying, "Yeah, he just, I just saw it. He just beat Clubber Lang. It was really great." And one of them smacked me in the head and said, "You know, what, kid, you watch too much of that movie bullshit. We want to tell you about the real Rocky." Rocky Marciano. And they're like, he was never beaten. He couldn't be beaten. You know, and I was like, I was like, I was scared, you know. <laughs> you know? Um, and that's why when we went to that statue dedication in 2012, and I wrote that uh, blog about it, and um, one of the things I said in there was, you know, and I told that story, and I said, you know, uh, going up there, I said, I could feel there's both of them, their spirits with me. And I said, um, and I knew they were proud of me the way, you know, I turned out. And I said, yeah, even for a kid that grew up watching too much of that movie, bullshit. <laughs> right. So. Well, um, you know, definitely it's going to be uh, somebody who's really missed. But he lived a full life, Hank. And we're going uh, we're gonna to keep up with all the tributes and everything like that. We'll post whatever we can on the website. Uh, in addition to whatever we can say here about um, arrangements, you know, you said something about the, the church tomorrow. Um, yeah. So just if anybody listening wants to um, do any kind of gift or whatever or send condolences, how do they do it? Uh, I, will, I will send you all the information, Rich. Um, I'll send you the full um, obituary with um, how you can... Um, you know, do a donation in his name, I believe it's the Jimmy Dolga Fund, um, which is for kids with cancer, if I'm not mistaken, and I apologize if I am. Um, but I will um, send all that uh, to both of you guys right, right now. All right, so we'll get that out tonight on Facebook and then uh, at some point on the website too and also in the description of the, of the show this week. 
And as Thank you. Uh, as I'm sure he would want the show to go on, we do have some yep. some planned conversations and discussions uh, to her tonight. We got a little bit of boxing schedule and results to talk about. No, not really a lot of uh, MMA results last week because nothing was going on. But we do have a big one coming up: McGregor versus yep. Cerrone. That whole card, UFC, and uh, it's the only big event this week to talk about. So. That's all the MMA stuff, and we even have a wrestling story, although it's also an unfortunate, sad one. Uh, yeah. Rocky Johnson, speaking of Rockies, uh, yeah. the father of Dwayne Johnson just died at 75, so uh, didn't even get 20 years. So, uh, Hank had 20 years on him. Uh, I didn't, I didn't at least when I looked yesterday, did not have a um, cause of death um, posted or identified. I don't know if it was sudden, if it was unexpected. I don't know if he was ill. Uh, I hadn't heard well, anything. I'm reading it right now. Um, no cause was given. Uh, but I would, if I had to guess, I would say it had to be something with the heart. Uh, yeah, a lot I, I, I believe that. Bodybuilders um, and, and just black people in general have uh, have a higher rate of heart disease. So, he was 75 yeah. years old. I, I would just guess it was probably heart related. But again, we, we don't know. Anyway, he was born in Nova Scotia, and he rose to fame in the 80s as a very muscular wrestler who jumped off the ropes and delivered jabs and called himself the king of the dropkick. Uh, and he dis- dispatched a lot of people, they say, with that singular move. Uh, but uh, he actually was um, in, in a little bit of history because he was the first black world tag team champion in WWE history um, with uh, a guy named Tony Atlas. Tony Atlas, yes, Mr. USA. And uh, they, they were known as the Soul Patrol. <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he says uh, that uh, there was also re- racism in professional wrestling, wrestling as much as everything else was fake, that was real. He says, uh, now it's more covered up, but there was a lot. I was headstrong, he said in an, in an interview. I kept myself in shape, and the stuff they were doing in the South, I wouldn't go for. They wanted to whip me on TV like they used to do with the slaves and all that. I said, no, I came in as, as an athlete, and I'll leave as an athlete, and they respected me for that. <clears throat> and then, uh, obviously, his son showed an interest in wrestling, and uh, the father offered to train him. Uh, yeah. And he said, I'm going to train you 150%. And he said, I was hard on him, but he never gave up. And then, uh, obviously, Dwayne took The Rock as his nickname, uh, as tribute to his dad. But, yeah. But uh, he actually did get uh, the Rocky name from Marciano, believe it or not. I didn't even know this. Uh, Rocky Johnson, he said it was a tribute to two of his favorite boxing greats, Rocky Marciano and Jack Johnson. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. Well, I thought that was his real last name, but apparently not. Uh, so there it is. Um, but he found his greatest success in the WWE, which he joined in 1983, which was not what it was called then, if I remember correctly. It was called the WWF until the World Wildlife Fund got involved. Yeah, damn wild papers. <laughs> so, uh, Dwayne made his debut in 1996, so 13 years later. And, you know, the, the funny thing is how everything is cyclical in life. Dwayne's first WWF opponent, I will likely see it tomorrow's recall. Wow. Because he's a guy from Hank's hometown in Norristown. The Rocky connection, unreal. I, yeah. I did not even know that. I hadn't even read the article before we went on the air. So that's just crazy, nutty. All right, we got a couple other news things to cover, and then we're going to go to events and previews and results and all that. Um, here's one that you don't hear about every day, history related. Uh, you probably never heard about this guy, Taddeus. Petrzowski, Petrzowski, sorry. He was uh, a boxing champion 
And he's going to be in, in a movie that's going to premiere in the fall of 2020. But he wasn't a kind of boxing champion you would recognize or remember because he was the Auschwitz Birkenau boxing champion. Um, oh. And I, I do remember years ago there was a movie with Willem Dafoe about a boxer in a concentration camp, but I could not tell you what the name was or, you know, where to find it. But I did have it on VHS, so that's how old it is. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, uh, I think it was a one-word title, too, uh, if I remember correctly. But maybe I'll, I'll have to research it later and figure out what it is. But this one is called Champion. It's going to be a feature-length film. They just finished shooting. Um, so this is a, a, a director who's a grandson of one of the former Auschwitz prisoners. Uh, and he wanted to tell this cinematic story, which is um, within the first period of operation of that concentration camp. And the movie tells the story of a man who fought for his life in the Nazi German concentration camp inferno with his own fists. Petr Zikowski was one of the very first prisoners of Auschwitz, number 77. During his imprisonment, he fought dozens of times, not only against fellow prisoners, but also against several German boxing champions, winning the vast majority of his fights. Uh, and the one I watched, I, I don't think it was the same guy, but uh, basically they treated him better than the other prisoners. They gave him bread after his fights when his other prisoners would have to fight for one loaf amongst themselves. You know, he would have a whole one to himself. Uh, they give him steak and alcohol and, and uh, you know, he was just basically providing entertainment for the officers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because he was su such a tough guy, they treated him with way more respect than the rest of the prisoners. But he was still a prisoner. So, it was kind of a kind of an ironic situation but yeah this ought to be a good movie um, and uh, I'll keep everybody up to date on when it comes out and um, I hate to make a joke about Auschwitz but <laughs> one time when I was at the Air Force Academy somebody dropped Auschwitz on me at the, the dinner table because I wasn't touching my food uh, and uh, so I'm just picking at it, drinking water, and one of the guys at the table, I was obviously cutting weight for for boxing, and uh, one of the guys at the table was like, what the hell's your problem, Bergeron? You look like you're from Auschwitz over there. <laughs> I said, no, sir, I have to, I have to lose weight. He said, well, then quit picking at it. Just don't eat it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, unreal. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, Auschwitz, yeah. I cannot imagine just being in a place like that and seeing what all those guys saw, but then have to, having to, you know, box like a trained bear on a chain. Uh, I just, I can't imagine. That's That's got to be rough. I mean, obviously, he probably had a same similar situation with the other guy when he got some extra privileges, but, you know, that's hell as it is. And you got to go through hell in the ring, too. Should be a good movie. Ah, and anyway, speaking of going through hell, uh, sounds like it's going to be a pretty amazing main event on uh, Saturday night, UFC 246, McGregor versus Cerrone. And for McGregor, it's going to be a big payday, if you believe him, anyway. I mean, we don't know exactly what his payday as far as fight pay is going to be, you know, base pay, as you would say. But... He is claiming in the press that he'll make over $80 million. Wow. Um, now, I could see that if uh, we're talking about sponsorships, too. Uh, but even though Reebok's <laughs> the only one that they can put on their shorts or whatever in the cage and, and all that, he's, anybody that's attached to him in his name is going to make bank when he steps into that cage, so... Uh, it's, it's a lot different than any other fighter. Also, he has his whiskey company. Now, if if it's an official thing, which it probably is, he'll get some free advertisement or he's got it written into his contract or whatever that he gets a, some kind of advertisement for his company. Because it seems like every time they do a UFC event and he's on it, 
his whiskey is either stamped on the cage or they do a lot of commercials. So I'm thinking that's probably part of his $80 million right there that he's thinking he's going to make off sales. Uh, that's probably a big chunk. And then who knows what else. Um, but it's definitely... Definitely a big payday. And he's also looking past Cerrone at the same time because he's talking more about boxing than he is about MMA and not killing the idea of a rematch at all with Floyd Mayweather. But he also says that he's been in talks to fight Manny Pacquiao in a boxing match. Um... Now, I could see either one happening. Uh, that's the only way Floyd comes back to boxing, period, is if he fights an MMA fighter. It doesn't have to be McGregor, but he's going to fight right. an MMA fighter because he feels like that's the best advantage. And he's probably right there. Uh, but I don't think I just don't think it's going to be uh, McGregor because I don't think there's enough interest in that. But McGregor versus Pacquiao, different story, I think. But McGregor really has to show his boxing skill here with Cerrone, and word is that he has put out a challenge to Cerrone, no takedowns. We're just going to go and slug it out in the middle of the cage, which is kind of like saying, okay, um, let's just fight to my advantage, and you forget about everything <laughs> that you got to one-up on me on. Uh, so I don't know if Cerrone is going to take that bait, but we'll see. Um, either way, it's going to be a good fight. I don't think it's a fight that's really going to challenge McGregor as far as, you know, experience-wise. He's gone in uh, and, and lost by TKO or KO his last two fights, Cerrone. And he's he's been at his greatest before, and I'd love to see him pull it off. Um, and I'm sure he's had more of a training camp for this one than he's had on, on a lot of his past opportunities. But I, I, I have a tough time saying that. McGregor is going to lose this one. I mean, he's got so much to gain here by making a good performance. And obviously Cerrone has a ton to gain too by pulling off the upset. So I'm pulling, I'm definitely pulling for Cowboy. But the notorious is notorious. <laughs> so... He's, he's obviously also changing his attitude towards the fight game as well. I know we've talked about this on a couple past shows, but it's really showing, too, in the hype leading up to this fight. These guys are actually being respectful to each other, So, which was actually a headline I saw the other day, and I was just like, really? <laughs> you know, this, this guy is really is transforming. Uh, and, you know, he's obviously had a long time to consider what's going to be his future, what, what his path will be in, in MMA and boxing and all that. And he really is wanting to prove that MMA fighters can hang in boxing. <clears throat> and I think, I think judging by his performance in the first Floyd Mayweather fight, well, I'm not saying that there's going to be another one, but <laughs> in the only oh. Floyd Mayweather fight... He could definitely make a statement uh, with a different opponent. It's just he'll never beat Floyd. I mean, but to take that opportunity in your first ever boxing match and do that with it, obviously, like I said, he could never lose. Going into that, I, that was my feeling. He could not lose as long as he lasts the distance. Yeah, he got knocked out in the, T the TKO in the 11th, but he probably could have lasted the distance there. Uh, <clears throat> And then there's also the talk of Mayweather taking it easy on him, but either way, he held his own. You can't argue against that. So him throwing this out there that he might be fighting Manny Pacquiao also makes you wonder, how is the UFC going to keep doing that, letting him come to the MMA circle and then go off to boxing and not open it to everybody else? Uh, I don't see that flying for more than one occasion in that special event. I don't think that is going to happen again until they open it up to all UFC fighters to have opportunities just like that. Um, so in that way, what I've always been asking him to do, get out there and speak on behalf of the fighters and try to get them more opportunities, he might actually be a pioneer that helps the sport. 
because it will give some of these guys more opportunity to do shit elsewhere when they're not getting the call from the UFC. <clears throat> or maybe it rolls into something of, you know, use for Zuffa Boxing when they get this set up. Uh, but also, this is going to lead into another story about uh, the PFL. Not the PFL. Yeah, the PFL. I was thinking it was Premier Boxing <laughs> Champions. <laughs> Sorry. That was my mistake. It is the PFL. They completed a $50 million uh, investment round, but we'll get to that in a minute. That was not related. I thought it was related to Premier Boxing Champions. That's why I was going to mention it. But anyway, Connor thinks he's going to make $80 million. Who knows what he's really going to get. Uh, but it's not out of the realm for him to make $80 million in a boxing match. <laughs> it's just, uh, will the people want to see it? That's the question. The other person he's talked about fighting is Pauli Malignaggi. Now, that's the guy I believe he should have fought first. Would have made way more sense. <laughs> and then, if he did well against Pauli, he should have fought Floyd. Uh, and then gone from there. But obviously, you know, they, they did it for the maximum benefits the biggest payday they could possibly get uh but you know it's kind of hard uh to say it proves anything the first one because you're you're taking a guy that's raw never boxed in his life professionally and you're throwing him in there yeah he's had mma fights but he's never boxed in his life <clears throat> the only said the thing i used to say the only way that problem or that dilemma of who's better would be solved is if you had two matches, one boxing match and one MMA match, and then a chess match to solve it if it's a draw. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, a, a riveting game of Yahtzee. Yeah. <laughs> Something. Pictionary. Uh, we got to figure it out. But, yeah, tiebreaker would be tough there. So, it's obviously going to be a pretty big card. Um, that's not the only big fight on it. I believe it's the only championship fight, though. Oh, no, it's not for championship. I don't think. Is it, Tom? Is there a belt on the line? Do you know? Tom? Still with us? <laughs> I think we put him to sleep. Uh-oh. <laughs> we must, uh, must have dropped him. We'll get him back on. Uh, it's probably a five-round fight because it's the main event, but I'm just not sure if it's for a title. Usually when fighters come back and they had a title, uh, you know, they'll, they'll keep it. Obviously, he didn't get the title from Nurmagomedov, but, uh, yeah, I believe he had another title at the time, so, because he's two different weight classes, titles. So, I'm not sure. But we'll find out. Get Tom. We'll figure him out. Also, the co main event is uh, Holly Holm, 12 and 5, versus Raquel Pennington, who's 10 and 7. So that should be a pretty good female fight. They're both boxing oriented. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that one. Uh, Alexei Olenek. Probably has uh, the most experience as far as his record uh, of anybody in the UFC. He's 57 13 and 1. Going up against Maurice Green, who's 8 and 3. 8, 3, 0, 8, 1, 2, 9, 3, 8, oh, 6. Sorry. Is not available. I'm trying to hang up on Tom here. <laughs> I'll have to figure out what happened to Tom later, I guess. Uh, uh, also, Claudia Gadella versus Alexa Grasso. Another female fight. Claudia is 17-4. and four. Alexa is 11-3. and three. And then we got Showtime. Anthony Pettis, 22-9 and nine against up-and-comer Diego Ferreira. Won the Brazilian Ultimate Fighter years ago. He is 16-2. and two. And then we got Roxanne Modafferi, 23-16. and 16. Fighting undefeated Macy Barber, who's 8 and 0. And then we got Andre Feely. Blast from the past, been around a while. He is 20 and 6. Fighting Sadiq Yusuf, who is 10 and 1. And we got uh, the tough names here, or at least one. Nazrat Hakparast. He is 11 and 2. Fighting Drew Dober. 
Drew Dober. He is 21 and 9. Uh, Justin Ledette. He is 9 and 2, fighting Alexa Kamur, who's 5 and 0. Oh. And we got Tim Elliott, 15, 9 and 1, fighting the undefeated Askar Askarov, who is 10, 0 oh, and 1. And we got Odie Osborne, 8 and 2, fighting Brian Kelleher, who is 19 and 10. And then first fight of the night, Sabina Mazo, 7 and 1, versus JJ Aldrich, who is 8 and 3. And the one uh, story I was going to talk about, I thought it was the Premier Boxing Champions, BBC, but I got the an a- acronym wrong. Uh, the PFL, yeah. or the Professional Fight League, uh, it's getting some interest from a very familiar face to us, Mike Tyson. And also they're doing a $50 million investment round. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the format is a little different. They do a playoff every year, like football. Uh, they have, give a million dollars to the guy who wins the round robin tournament, and I believe they have to fight twice in one night on the final, um, in the finals, to win. So it's a tough, grueling effort, and it's you know it's a little bit more true to the original format of the UFC. Uh, but uh, you know it's kind of a rollover in some sense of the. Um, it was it not the professional the professional fight league is what it's called now, but it was uh, was a whole nother organization. Justin Gaethje was in it, uh, a couple other UFC fighters that crossed over. Uh, but it was definitely not as big as it is now. There's a couple more high profile people behind it. Just drawing a blank on what it used to be called for some reason. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's getting there. And it's, uh, it's starting to turn some heads. People are really getting behind the stories of these people that become millionaires in the process of going through the season. It's, it's already had its second season. And it's not, it's not on um, you know a big, huge network, but it's on mainstream TV. And they're starting to gain headway. And now they're, uh, they just closed a $50 million Series C funding round on Christmas Eve. So they have a total funding of a hundred million dollars, and Mike Tyson is going to be uh, a big part of it. Uh, when they did their playoffs the last time and the final round, Mike actually delivered the checks to each winner. Wow! So you know that's that's how far he's willing to go. He's putting his face behind it. Uh, but also they're going to go one step further. Um, he's going to help recruit and sharpen the marketing some of their new fighters, according to the founder, co-founder Don Davis. He says, no one knows what it's like to be a champion more than Mike Tyson, how to become one, and the pitfalls of being one financially, emotionally, and psychologically. So, obviously, that's true. Uh, And Tyson's also going to co-host a new show. Now, this is good for the PFL. And it's going to be on ESPN2 and ESPN+, 30-minute episodes. It's going to be called uh, Mike Tyson's New Fight Game. And they'll preview uh, 10 PFL events during the year and also look back at some of Tyson's classic matchups in the ring. Uh, so it's going to be like inside the NFL, but more irreverent and freewheeling, according to the PFL people. Tyson says, I'm excited to find and mentor the next generation of MMA world champions. PFL's pay scale is aligned with my principles of paying fighters more for the entertainment value they create. MMA fighters are also prize fighters, and when you enhance the prize, you enhance their ability to thrive outside the cage. I wonder if somebody helped him with that statement. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, yeah. So, it was launched in uh, 2018. There's the company it was from. The World Series of Fighting. It was basically a a rebranding of that. And uh, this is definitely more of that World Series environment. Um that we would see in baseball, like, you know, playoffs and then championships. <clears throat> anyway, uh, this latest round was led by Swan and Legend Venture Partners and Matterhorn Private Equity. And uh, the Swan co-founder, Fred Schofield, is a partner in the Washington Nationals as well as Monumental Sports and Entertainments, which owns Washington's teams in the NHL, the Capitals, and the NBA, the Wizards. 
and also the WNBA, the Mystics. It's the first U.S. investment by Matterhorn, a consortium of wealthy Italian families. There you go, Tony. There we go. Some Italian blood in the fight game. Who would have thunk? And um, there's also some other early investors, uh, sports team owners Ted Leonisis, uh, Dave Blitzer, and Mark Lerner, and then celebrities Kevin Hart, Mark Burnett, reality TV guy, and motivational guru Tony Robbins. Wow. So some big names, big people behind it, uh, and let's see if it just goes bigger. They were on ESPN2 last year in 2009. They averaged 236,000 viewers, up 75% from the first year on NBC Sports Network. Uh, The UFC is four times bigger, but uh, they're starting to kind of peter out and level off. So uh, there's there's room, room for improvement there, room for advancement. And I got to love that model of, you know, being able to go into every year with a chance at a million dollar payday at the end of it. Oh, that's got to be nice. And I do believe they still pay for, you know, fighters training and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they definitely do it differently. Uh, kind of like the IFL back in the day when they had teams. <coughs> Team MMA in a ring. A little different. Anyway, uh, boxing. We had a pretty interesting bout last week. Jesse Hart versus Joe Smith Jr. I didn't see it. I heard a lot about it. I did. Uh, I did. But Joe um, Smith Jr. pulled it out. You know yeah, that? well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say pulled it out, Rich. I would <laughs> say dominated. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between a split decision and a blind judge <laughs> scoring for the wrong guy. Now, I like Jesse Hart. I've met Jesse Hart. I followed Jesse Hart from, from when he was starting. Um, I know people that know him very well. Um, his one trainer I know very well, uh, Danny Davis. Uh, I know Fred Jenkins. I've met in passing his lead trainer. Um, there was bad blood going into this fight. Uh, you know, Jesse Hart was a super middleweight, uh, challenged for the super middleweight title twice. Uh, and fell short both times, very close decisions. Um, and he moved up to light heavyweight with the aspiration to fight Joe Smith. The reason was Joe Smith is the fighter that retired Bernard Hopkins three years ago, not be hopped out of the ring in the eighth round. Um, the only stop is also Bernard's career. So Jesse Hart took this personally because B Hop was his mentor, his idol. Um, and they had a face to face, like sit down interview, like, um, you know, before the fight they were showing on TV, and, you know, it was it was heated, you know, and Jesse Hart says, you know, I'm coming for you, I'm not, I'm not going to box, you know, I'm coming to take you out, and last week, when I was talking about this fight, I said, it's going to be the tale of, you know, Jesse Hart's the, the more skilled fighter, he's the better boxer, um, he's faster, he's more athletic, Joe Smith is strong, physical, rugged, powerful, straightforward, uh, rough and tumble. Um, you know, and I said, it's going to see if Joe Smith can pressure him or if Jesse Hart can keep the fight in the center of the ring and box him. Um, Jesse Hart claimed that he was going to come right to Joe Smith. Joe Smith met him in the center of the ring and back to Jesse Hart straight back. Um, he scored a knockdown on Jesse in the seventh round. Uh, he had him hurt a couple times. Uh, I thought it was going to be close to a stoppage uh, in the seventh round. Jesse held on, made the distance. I had him winning one round, maybe the fourth or fifth. Um, two judges had it correct, uh, 98-91, 97-92, which was a little closer than I thought. The third judge was abysmal, had it 95-94. He gave Hart six rounds, and I don't know how that's possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did read something on Facebook where somebody said that, you know, it just seemed like Jesse didn't have the will to fight. He didn't bring... His A game at all. Yeah. And uh, you could just tell he was off. Yeah. So, this is what it is. You know, you got situations where the hype train goes faster than the actual reality. <laughs> so, uh, it was billed as a pretty big opportunity and a, you know, a 
very well matched fight, but Joe Smith Jr. jumps back in the win column. Uh, we also had a bad, bad, was bad Saturday for the Burgos brothers. Juan Carlos and Jose Alejandro both lost their fights. Uh, Juan Carlos lost, lost to uh, Hector Tanahara on Saturday, and Jose Alejandro lost to Joshua Franco. We also had Jamie Munguia getting a big win over Spike, Gary O'Sullivan. Uh, Lucas Ryan Ariel Bastida beating Gonzalo Andres Chaparro. I don't know why they've got that one on there. I haven't heard either one of those guys. But Anyway, Steven Nelson also getting a big win over Sem Killick. Travel Mazion beating Fernando Castaneda. And then the last one uh, from Saturday listed here is Anas Masawadi beating Cedric Haynard. How do you like to have a, a first name of an ass? <laughs> A-N-A-S-S. I don't know how that works. That's funny. Uh, so Saturday the 18th. We got a big one over in Hamburg, Germany. Sebastian Formella in the main event at welterweight. 21-0 fighting Roberto Ariaza. who's 18-1. One. That's for the IBO World Welterweight title there. And the vacant German International Cruiserweight title on the line between Roman Fress, 9-0, and Matteo Rondina, who is 9-4. And, and we got uh, some young heavyweights. Peter Kadiru, 6-0, and Thomas Selec, 11-1, fighting for the vacant WBC Youth World Heavyweight title. Not a lot of action going on this weekend. Uh, over in the Philippines, we have a decent main event. Michael Mendoza, 10-1-2, fighting Stevenus Nana Bao, who is 10-12-2 for the World Boxing Foundation International Flyweight title. That's really the only big fight on that card. And we go down to Pueblo, Colorado for this one. Uh, not on TV or anything, nothing too spectacular on the undercard, but the main event's worth talking about. Marvin Cordova Jr. comes in at 22-2-1, facing, facing Hector Velazquez, who is 56-30-3. And, and he's only won one out of his last six. Yeah, that's a lot of fights. In Louisville, we have Carlos Dixon at Super Featherweight, 10 and 1, fighting Luis Ronaldo Castillo, who's 22 and 5 for the WBC Youth Silver Super Featherweight title. And here's a big one on ESPN Plus: Elider Alvarez in the main event at Turning Stone Resort, Turning Stone Resort and Casino in Verona, New York. The lighter is 24 and 1, fighting Michael Seals, who's 24 and 2. That should be a good fight. I mean, you know, Alvarez had that big win over um, Sergey Kovalev um, back in 2018. And then um, Kovalev bested him in the rematch by, you know, sitting there and, and using skill instead of um, brawn. And, and now it's a chance for Alvarez to take on a, a skilled opponent, you know, a guy that's not going to be easy to, um, you know, handle out there. And so that should be it should be an interesting, um, you know, uh, type of matchup. All right. Um, then we got Felix Verdejo, twenty-five and one, fighting Manuel Ray Rojas, who is eighteen and three at lightweight. Super Bantamweights, Jonathan Guzman, 23-1, fighting Rodolfo Hernandez Montoya. 30 wins, 8 losses, 1 draw there. And we got Christopher Diaz, 24-2, versus Adilson Dos Santos, who's 19-7. We got Abraham Nova, 17-0, facing Pedro Navarrete, who's 30-24-3. and Obviously an opponent there, but uh, another another fight underneath that's pretty decent. Devin Vargas at heavyweight. He's twenty one and six, fighting Victor Bisball, who's twenty three and four. So that ought to be a big slugfest. <clears throat> I don't know if it's going to be televised. 
And then, of course, we started off with Philly. We're going to end with Philly. Uh, the Lycoris Center is hosting a big one yep. on Saturday. Julian Williams in the main event. He's 27-1-1. One and, one. and his opponent is Jason Rosario, who is 19-1-1. One one. That's for the WBA World Super Welterweight title and the IBF World Super Welterweight title. Also the IBO yeah. World Superweight title. You know, it's crazy, Rich. It's like, you know, you go to a fight card, you know, back in the day, the small, you know, arena, like the uh, National Guard Armory in Northeast Philadelphia. And you, you see some fighters, and some fighters, like, really stand out to you. I went there. Um, I just took a kid that I used to train back in the day. Um, took him and his father to the first fight card at the Armory um, back in 2011. And, you know, there's some decent, you know, a few decent scraps on there. Um, but the guy that really stood out to me, and it was one of the fights um, I covered, Fighters Unlimited, was as a kid, Julian Williams. You know, I think he was maybe 6-0 and at the time, maybe 7-0. And, um, you know, you thought, like, this is a kid you, you might want to keep your eye on. And then a few years later, he's, you know, challenging um, one of the Charlo brothers. Um, and he lost, you know, it was a stoppage loss. Rebounded and got a shot with uh, Jared Hurd, and he put on, you know, just a, you know, virtuous performance. You know, he scored the knockdown, um, and he annexed that title, and now he's, you know, defending it in Philadelphia. Um, I had original plans to go down to this one. I was going to take a, um, my dad was going to go, a friend of mine uh, was going to go, um, but then we had gotten a little bit backed up. Um, and then it was like, oh, pending weather, we didn't know how bad the snowstorm was going to be, so we were kind of holding off, and then the whole hang thing happened, and it was like, you know what, after I get through tomorrow, I think I'm just going to take a few days to just completely unwind, so I didn't have the energy to try to fight my way down to um, Philadelphia. Right. Well, there's going to be uh, plenty of action, and it's going to be on Fox, so you won't you won't miss all of it. Yeah, I'm going to watch it. Um, we also got Chris Colbert versus Jezreel Corrales. Uh, Chris is 13-0. and Corrales is 23-3. and That's for the interim WBA World Super Featherweight title. We got Jorge Cota, 29-4, fighting Thomas LaManna, who's 28-2-1. And, and I thought he retired five years ago, but he keeps popping back up. Uh, Cornflake. That's one of the weirdest nicknames yep. I've ever heard in boxing. But he's still going. Uh, Ricky Lopez, 21-4-1, fighting Jose Luis Gallegos, who's 18-8. And and that about rounds out the good stuff. We also have a guy that we've covered for a while here on uh, Fight News Unlimited, uh, Vito Milnicki Jr. He's the son of a uh, promoter, Vito Mil- Milnicki. And uh, he's 3-0, and uh, fighting Preston Wilson, who's 6-3-1. So taking a little bit of a step up there, I imagine. Uh, that's pretty good. Good stuff. we we'll be wishing him well. And that's about it for us this week. We're running out of room on my computer. <laughs> so, good thing we're running out of content. Till next week, I guess that's well, all. Well, I also wanted to mention, um, before I forget, um, Philadelphia's Sonny Kanto um, had another big win last week, first round stoppage. The opponent was a last minute kind of guy. Um, he's a guy you're supposed to take out. Sonny did first round. Um, and he'll be, he announced that he'll be leaving shortly to go to Vegas to be training with uh, Tyson Fury again. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, so things are looking up, you know. Um, I want to thank both of you guys, Tom, Rich, uh, first of all, for allowing me that platform at the beginning of our show to pay tribute to uh, my friend and uh, our legend, uh, San Francisco, who uh, left us this week. And um, I sent you guys uh, some of the uh, tribute articles, uh, the obituaries, uh, um clip of me on his show, uh, his box rack, a bunch of stuff. Um, and it has on the obituary how you can do uh, donations um, to it's the Jimmy Dolga Memorial Fund, which is through Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to miss him. And, um, you know, I just want to thank, you know, thank him for seeing something to me when a lot of guys did. All right. Great guy, and I'm sure he's up there. He, he didn't. He he lived a nice full life, and it uh, sounds like um, 
you know, he kind of came to terms with it. He had time to be ready yeah. for it. So uh, rest in peace, yeah. Hank. And uh, yeah. thanks for giving him giving him a little bit of a tribute here. And obviously uh, he's going to get a real big one when they finally put him in the ground. And, yeah. uh, I've been uh, kind of familiar with death over these last few years. So yeah, I know, I know you know. have. But let's hope this isn't at the start of a trend here, right? Yeah, right. All right, so we'll put, well, put all you, that Jim. in the show description, and we'll get this thing published. Okay, sounds good, man. Thanks for stopping by.